we were not just in this plain old theater. It, was, it never felt like it was a plain old play. We were really introducing a whole new world to these people, people who had never met a Jew in their lives. It's an emotional train. You ride that train every night and twice on matinee day. It kind of changed the way that I thought about history and also the world. I had sincerity. I wanted to play this girl that I empathized with and had been murdered by the Nazis. I wanted to play her right. You know, it's just something that I feel like I will probably carry with me for my whole life. He'd been interested in making a war film after the war, and he just never found the right subject. Obviously, the war was a defining part of his life, and he kind of came to feel that Anne Frank was his war film. His films often involved outsiders and underdogs. Shane was an outsider. Uh, some people even go, who, who talk about that even then add Jesus of Nazareth. This is Adam Lanker, the creator and host of Playing Anne Frank, a podcast from The Forward about the dramatic life of the diary of Anne Frank. I'm on the phone with George Stevens, Jr., He worked in Washington during the Kennedy administration, and he was the founding director of the American Film Institute. In 2009, Barack Obama named him co-chairman of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. For the Diary of Anne Frank, he was what's called the second unit director. Most of the movie was shot inside on a soundstage at 20th Century Fox, but the second unit of the film crew shot exteriors in Amsterdam. When you see something happening on the streets of Amsterdam, outside where the Frank family is hiding, George Stevens Jr. is the one who directed those scenes. His father, George Stevens, was the director of the Diary of Anne Frank, which meant he was in charge of everything else. If you're a fan of big, sweeping Hollywood movies, you've probably seen a George Stevens film. He directed Shane and Giant and A Place in the Sun and the greatest story ever told about the life of Jesus Christ. He also was part of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. He shot footage of D-Day and the liberation of the concentration camps at Dubin and Dachau. His films were presented as evidence at the Nuremberg trials. His son, George Stevens Jr., wrote a memoir. It's called My Place in the Sun. There's a chapter about the time he spent working with his father on Anne Frank. He talks about how the two of them met Anne's father, Otto, in Amsterdam. Otto Frank showed them Anne's original diary with its red, white, and beige cover. And then they took a taxi boat to get to the secret annex. Empty now. Faded spots on the walls where there'd once been pictures. There's a picture in the memoir that George Stevens Jr. wrote. His father in a trench coat looking on. Otto Frank with his hand on a railing. About to mount the stairs once more to go up into that secret annex trekked around Normandy and then went to Amsterdam and went to meet Otto Frank at his little office in in Amsterdam and then with him to the 263 Princeton Croft. And just the three of us went up in that totally empty building, which was, you know, memorable. And uh, and I I had a camera and I took that one picture of my father and Otto as we we were going up the stairs to the hiding place. It must have been incredibly emotionally impactful to be standing there with him in this place that you'd only seen in a play or in a script. Yeah, and, and my father was a, a very uh, considerate person and treated people with respect. And, but when we got up to the top there and behind the bookcase and in the place, yes, and you look around and this is where they lived. And, you know, the, where pictures have been on the wall, you saw the absence of the pictures. But Dad did feel that he had to ask him if he would describe what happened on that last day. And, uh, and he did. And, you know, just three people standing in a bare room. You know, I can't think of a more touching conversation that I've been part of in my life, you know. 
This is episode five. Anne goes to Hollywood. In early 1957, when The Diary of Anne Frank was still on Broadway, 20th Century Fox won a bidding war to turn it into a movie. They hired George Stevens for the job. He cast some of the major roles with actors who'd been in the play. Joseph Schulkraut and Gusty Huber would play Mr. and Mrs. Frank. Lou Jacoby would play Mr. Van Dan. The roles of the younger actors were up for grabs. It was a thing in those days to drum up advanced publicity for a movie by auditioning thousands of actors for a sought-after role. If you spend any time with documentaries about the golden age of Hollywood, you've probably seen footage of screen tests, like the ones where David Selznick auditioned a bunch of Scarlett O'Hara's for Gone with the Wind before he settled on Vivian Lee. Fiddle-dee-dee. Ashley Wilkes told me he liked to see a girl with a healthy appetite. Otto Preminger did the same thing with St. Joan. He sent out millions of entry blanks to schools. He crisscrossed the country studying the pictures and resumes of the 20,000 he'd received before he settled on Gene Seberg to play Joan of Arc. George Stevens put his son in charge of a nationwide talent search to decide who would be Anne Frank. In the first month, they got 2,623 letters in the mail. I have no acting ability, and I'm sure I knew this at the time, but I still had a complete and utter fantasy that the, you know, the, the casting people would come to my high school in Brooklyn and find me. That's Enid Futterman. She's a writer who wound up later collaborating on a musical adaptation of The Diary of Anne Frank. But back in the day when George Stevens and his son were looking for an unknown star, she was just one of thousands who thought they might get to play Anne Frank. It was ridiculous, but... I think it was because I felt so connected and I knew I wanted to do something, but I had no idea what that could be. The movie columnist, Luella Parsons, was usually first with the gossip about who was going to star in any movie. When it came to the diary of Anne Frank, she was usually first with being wrong. Woodbury Hollywood News, featuring Luella Parsons, Hollywood's best-known, best-loved, most distinguished reporter, and her syndicate writer whose column appears in the Springfield, Massachusetts Republican and 799 other newspapers. Hello to all of you from New York. Well, here I am in the big town. Luella Parsons said Susan Strasberg, who played Anne Frank on Broadway, was a shoe in to play her in the movie. But Strasberg was already 20, and that seemed too old. Then Luella Parsons said Audrey Hepburn would get the gig. Supposedly, she was Otto Frank's favorite. Two weeks later, Sheila Graham, you know, the gossip columnist who had a famous affair with F. Scott Fitzgerald, she said Hepburn was out of the picture. Maybe it would be Mary Murphy, who starred with Marlon Brando in The Wild One. Hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? (laughs) The British actress, Perlita Nielsen, who'd played Anne in the London production, she flew in for a screen test. Margaret O'Brien said she was crushed she couldn't play Anne Frank. By early 1958, the Stevenses had narrowed down their list of Anne Franks from 10,000 applicants to just six finalists. There was Melinda Byron from Evanston, Illinois. She'd just appeared in a movie called Teenage Thunder. I don't want you to get in trouble with the police again. Come on, Johnny, let's go. Betty, I kind of had the idea you wanted to be my girl. Well, I do want to be your girl. Johnny, you're hurting my arm. There was Alana Cooper from Tel Aviv, also known as Alana Eden. She'd starred in the biblical film, The Story of Ruth. I talked with a man who who believes no God could be pleased to accept the life of a child on the altar. I could not meet his questioning. There was Sabina Sinjin, a 14-year-old actress and singer from Berlin, Marianne Sarstadt, a ballerina from Amsterdam, Characlea Baxavanos of Vienna, Marie Versini of Paris, and there was a 17-year-old model from New Jersey who caught George Stevens Jr.'s eye. Her name was Millie Perkins. And when you saw Millie Perkins, either her screen test or what leapt, do you remember what leapt out to you about her? Certainly her eyes, her kind of delicacy, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to, well, I, I really wouldn't want to try and characterize it too much. 
And uh, she just seemed like the right person, you know, weighed against the others. I had been getting calls from California from a publicist for uh, George Stevens, who directed the movie, saying that he wanted to meet me. He'd seen my photos on top of magazines. He called someone that said, find this girl, I want to interview her. I'm looking for an unknown girl to play Anne Frank. That's Millie Perkins talking to me on the phone from California. She told me what she knew about the history behind the diary of Anne Frank before George Stevens tapped her to star in it. Not much. I wasn't interested. I wasn't. A, a people said something about being an actress. I said, oh, well, I'm not an actress, and I didn't know anything about the story or anything like that. I knew who George Stevens was because when I was in high school, he was the director of Giant, A Place in the Sun, which was my favorite movie and my favorite book of all time. Well, George directed the movie, and I went to see the movie, and I fell in love with the movie, and I always remember the name of the man that directed it. And some, I told somebody, you know, these, this, this George Stevens from California, they keep calling me from California. They want me to test for this movie called The Diary of Anne Frank. It's the first time I had mentioned it to anybody. And my French friends who were oh, astute, they said, oh, Millie, Millie, that's a very important movie. I said, really? And, you know, it was all new to me, right? So I'm in Paris, and, and um, I remember I cried all the way back from Paris to New York because I, I didn't want to go home, but I just said, oh, okay, I'll go home. And I got to New York, and George Stevens set up to have me to have an interview test for the Diary of Anne Frank. Once both George Stevens, the father and the son, had decided that Millie Perkins was the right actor to play Anne Frank, they still needed to get the go-ahead from one other person, Anne Frank's father. George invited me to go to his house to meet Otto Frank, because he wanted Otto to okay me. And I went to the house for dinner, and I had dinner, and then uh, George said, well, maybe you and Mr. Frank would like to go into the library and, and talk for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. It always makes me want to cry, because it wasn't a very emotional thing to me. But I went into the library with Mr. Funk, and he uh, and I sat there for a second, and we we were kind of shy with each other, and he we didn't know what to say because George had sent us to talk. And Mr. Funk looked down at my hand, and you know how I wish I could do it in person to you when you when you clasp your hand and you put your thumb inside your four fingers and you and it's holding the four fingers. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like a protective thing. Mr. Funk looked down at my hand. And he said, oh, my goodness. Ami used to sit that way all the time. And I knew that it meant something to him, and because it sure meant something to me when he looked at that. I knew that he recognized who I was, and that, and that I knew that it was going to be okay. George Stevens talked to the press about Millie Perkins. She was a quiet girl, he said, but then she starts to unfold, like an artichoke. One of the things he seemed to like was the fact that Millie Perkins hadn't been so sure she wanted the role. She was independent-minded and opinionated, a lot like the real-life Anne she was supposed to play. I had a mind of my own, and nobody could tell me what I could do or couldn't do. I decided. And how much of that did you bring into playing Anne Frank, that kind of mindset? Because that's who Anne Frank was. Anne Frank could not be told what she could or couldn't think. And what she, she could be told what she couldn't do because she was still young, but she, uh, uh, you know, she was protested things. But, you know, I was that kind of person. When I read the diary, I thought, oh my goodness, I know who she is. Because it was me. The greatest sniper of all time. The murder that rocked early Hollywood and its subsequent cover-up. Nazi terrorists in late 1940s Germany. The frantic search for Shambhala in the wake of the Russian Revolution. The American mercenary who saved the Chinese Empire. The submarine used in the American Revolution. The global pandemic that gave us the Third Reich. The Greek-French woman who worshipped Hitler as a Hindu avatar the father of modern Palestinian nationalism, his role in the Holocaust, and his relationship with Nazis who had affinities for Islam. What do all of these stories have in common? They are strange. They are unbelievable. 
They are perhaps even impossible, but they are all true. And you can learn about them on the History Impossible podcast. Subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use or visit historyimpossible.com today. The role of Peter Van Dan was played by Richard Beamer. A couple years later, he'd play Tony in the original movie of West Side Story. Diane Baker played Anne's older sister, Margaret. Maybe you know her from movies she appeared in later, like Marnie by Alfred Hitchcock and The Silence of the Lambs. Take this thing back to Baltimore. The Diary of Anne Frank was Diane's movie debut, too. While I was researching this podcast, Diane Baker was a little harder to get in touch with than some of the other people. It took a lot of phone calls, a personal letter, and the seal of approval from Millie Perkins. Millie and Diane met on the set of The Diary of Anne Frank, and they've been friends ever since. Mr. Stevens was, couldn't have been more wonderful to me and Millie. He carried peppermint around in his, I guess he kept it in his pocket for before a scene to give me something to take my mind off of the uh, worrying about the scene, just to give me a little pep, you know. <laughs> it was peppermint, and it was always very cooling, and it felt good, and it was it kept my mind off of worry, and he just put it candid to me as to say, you know, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. <laughs> it's not gonna be. And he tried to keep our spirits up the whole time with music. It was just, it was really a, a, a journey. There's a theme that runs through the memoir that George Stevens Jr. wrote. The attention his father lavished on every detail of his films, every actor, every inch of the set, every line of dialogue. At one point, George remembers telling his dad during the filming of Anne Frank that the movie looked finished to him. Maybe it was time to just wrap it up. Just think how many hours people will spend watching the film over the years, George Stevens told his son. Don't you think it's worth spending a little more of our time working to make it a better experience for them? We cared a great deal about doing it right. And, and, and you know, we had a German band and, and, and people, you know, German soldiers. And Amsterdam had not seen that since the war. So there was great interest in it. And there is that scene that we shot where they're, they arrest the greengrocer, you know, and, and you, you, you're seeing it sort of out of the window from a hiding place and then at ground level as well. And, you know, with these, these siren and the truck drives up and they haul this man out with his hands behind his head. He was the actual greengrocer who was taken away, went to camp, camps, and then came back and we discovered he was there, and he agreed to play the greengrocer. The movie of The Diary of Anne Frank opened in Cinemascope on March 18, 1959, at the RKO Palace Theater in New York. Women in furs and men in tuxedos stepped out of limos, under the marquee, and entered the theater. Harry Belafonte was at the premiere. So was Noel Coward. The actress Joanne Woodward, Abba Eben, who was Israel's ambassador to the UN at the time, 13 students from Fairlawn High School, that's where Millie Perkins had gone to school, they brought Millie a bouquet of red roses. The New York Daily News gave the Diary of Anne Frank four stars and called it a film masterpiece. The film columnist Dorothy Kilgallen said it was flawless. A little over a week later, Shelley Winters, who played Mrs. Van Dan, went on The Ed Sullivan Show to talk about the power the film had. This child said that when she examined history as she studied it, she saw that mankind always had the good triumph. She said that in spite of everything, I believe in the goodness in man. You know, and that comes over so shyly in this picture, and I want to recommend to the entire country to see it, because this this is a very wonderful experience. How about a wonderful hand for this fine young star? At the Academy Awards, Shelley Winters won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. And the winner is Miss Shelley Winters in the Diary of Anne Frank. 
Throughout this podcast, we've been talking about the impact of being involved in the Diary of Anne Frank. As with the play, the movie was a searing experience for many of the actors, and those behind the camera, too. Diane Baker kept acting, and also went into academia. She became director of the School of Motion Pictures and TV at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I think I, my entire life became a very serious endeavor. It wasn't a frivolous journey that I was on. In fact, probably my whole life has not been frivolous in any way. Millie Perkins continued to appear in movies off and on. She told me about one she did with Elvis Presley. He was a character. He wasn't my kind of person. He was a little bit younger than I was, and he was... He was just a, a country boy, you know, and every time, he, every time he finished shooting a scene, he had about three or four guys from the South. As soon as he finished shooting the scene, he, he'd get on the floor and start wrestling. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, God, this guy's a, a jerk. Don't tell anybody because I love him. But the point is, is that I'm now I'm sitting in the car with Elvis. And it's a scene where we're supposed to he, we were supposed to be talking, and he's supposed to start singing a love song to me. And I'm sitting in the front seat with him, and he has to start singing the love song. I remember looking out the window, thinking, oh, my God, this is so stupid. Nobody sings love songs to people. My sisters are going to tease the hell out of me. Oh, no. Oh, I can't bear this. And then I look over at Elvis, and he's looking at me. He says, you know, this is so stupid. People don't do things like this. And I looked at him, and I thought, oh, he's not so bad after all. It was a learning experience, and it was wonderful to find out that Elvis Presley was a special person. Millie's been in some pretty well-known TV shows and movies, Wild in the Streets and Wall Street, and there was this crazy, creepy cult movie she was in called The Witch Who Came from the Sea which looks like something Quentin Tarantino would be really into. But she never bought into the whole Hollywood thing. And there are big chunks of time where she drops off the map. She moved to Oregon to raise her family. She taught art and acting and hosted a local talk show. She only returned to Hollywood when she needed money. People came to my little teeny house in Jacksonville, Oregon, young people from the schools, and they would come and I would do acting classes with them. And I loved it. And I, and I just, I stayed in Oregon, I guess to get away from society and to get away from the cities and get away from movie business and all that. I just, did, I did what I wanted to do and tried things. I never, I never had an ambition to, to be a movie star or not to be a movie star. When something came along that interested me, I went and did that. As it turns out, probably the best example I can find of how the movie of the Diary of Anne Frank affected the people in it comes from someone I actually didn't talk to, Richard Beamer, who played Peter Van Dan. He didn't respond to my requests for an interview for this podcast, so I'm not even sure he got my letters. He acted for a while, maybe you saw him in Twin Peaks, and he directed some documentaries. But he took a more spiritual path. Millie Perkins told me he follows a different drummer, In 1998, he made It's a Beautiful World, about David Lynch's trip to India to meet Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation. Since I didn't talk to him, I didn't think I'd be able to figure out how playing Peter in the diary of Anne Frank affected him, or if it did at all. But then, while I was in the New York Library for the Performing Arts, I found an old documentary he made. In 1964, A few years after the diary of Anne Frank, Richard Beamer worked for the Mississippi Summer Project, registering young black voters. His experiences there became the subject of his movie. It was called A Regular Bouquet. In the final moments of this documentary, which runs about 45 minutes, Beamer says something that, if you've seen Anne Frank or if you've read it, it's going to sound very familiar. And listening to it, you get the sense that Anne Frank really did have a profound effect on him just like it had on everyone else. The second war for American independence has begun. It is a war against ignorance. And we who remain silent, passive, are condoning murder as surely as if we light the match, pull the rope, or fire the gun. People are really good at heart. And so the people of Mississippi, black, white, 
all. People are really good at heart. Down in Mississippi, where he was working for civil rights, Richard Beamer was still thinking about Anne Frank. The producer and the writers of the original Broadway play, they were still thinking about the diary of Anne Frank, too, and they were wondering what they would do next. The idea they came up with is one you may not have heard of, and it's what we'll talk about on the next episode of Playing Anne Frank. You've been listening to Playing Anne Frank. I'm Adam Langer. I'm the executive editor of The Forward. I wrote and created this podcast. It was produced and engineered by Cole Ocasio. Our associate producer is Scylla Shaman. She composed the original score, which features Anat Cohen on clarinet. Playing Anne Frank is a production of The Forward. Our editor-in-chief is Jody Redoran, and our CEO is Rachel fishman Federson. Playing Anne Frank is made possible in part by funding from Canvas, the Cy Sims Foundation, and Barbara Streisand. Our consulting producers are Julianne Hausler, Doug Matica, and Jerome Kramer. Additional editing and research by Samuel Breslow, Irene katz Connolly, Mira Fox, PJ Grissar, Beth Harpaz, and Matt Littman. The Forward's VP of Development is Lisa Lepson. Our grants manager is Jason Mandel. Our digital innovation director is Jacqueline DeBonis. Designed by Anya Ulinich and Angelie Zaslavsky. Special thanks to Stephanie Abu, Marie Kuhlman, Elizabeth Ellis, Jay Ehrlich, Whit Lacasio, Daniel Liddell, Charlie Meyerson, Lauren Allerhead, Dahlia Shaman, Solvay Zisnich, and to Lauren Pasell of Tink Media and Talia Zaks. The Forward Association is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 1897.